Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the sewist and quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Robin Cuthbertson, award-winning textile artist, pattern designer, and teacher. Born in Melbourne, Australia, and raised in Lower Plenty, which is about an hour northeast of Melbourne, she learned to sew from her mom. Robin was always interested in crafting, so sewing was a natural progression for her. She graduated from Melbourne University with degrees in engineering and physics, and spent most of her university free time hanging out with the juggling club and perfecting her circus skills on a unicycle. At age 30, while working on her PhD in engineering, Robin was diagnosed with mitochondrial disease and was forced to give up her engineering career. Her mom suggested she try machine quilting and as Robin puts it, it was love at first stitch. Initially creating large whole cloth quilts for shows, the cancellation of quilt shows during the pandemic caused a change in direction. She now focuses on intimate textile artworks combined with custom-designed laser-cut wooden frames. Robin's work combines quilting and woodworking, blending them into contemporary abstract artworks that affirm her love of both science and craft. When not creating, Robin practices snorkeling, underwater photography, and her newfound passion for free diving. Hi, Robin, and welcome to So-and-So. Thanks, Meg. I'm really excited to be here today. I am excited you're here. We have so much to share, and your story is just incredibly interesting. Uh, So I'm going to jump right in and say your mom taught you to sew. How did that happen? Um, It's hard to remember, to be honest. It feels like a long time ago now. But um, I guess I was always into crafty kind of stuff, and she used to sew all of our clothes. And I think I just kind of used to always bug her to let me use the sewing machine and she finally caved and um, <laughs> yeah she you were sort persistent. of oh yeah um and she sort of I remember her getting out lined paper and she wouldn't let me sew any fabric until I could follow the straight line on the paper without any thread and so that's sort of when I first started that was my oh, first sewing machine experience and I was really grumpy she wouldn't let me sew fabric <laughs> <laughs> so you made sure you got it right as soon as you could Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it took me a while, though, to be honest. <laughs> now, your your grandmother was also a big influence, right? Yeah, my grandmother was amazing. She um she used to be a tailor. I learned later. I didn't know at the time, um, but she was always doing something crafty. And she lived interstate, so we didn't we only saw her once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. But every time she came, she'd work on some different craft project with me. And you know, the first thing I'd do when she got here is I'd take her around the house and show her all the projects I'd been working on. Oh sure. And she was just really special. Um yeah. So you were talking about having to follow the straight line on the paper. <laughs> After you graduated from that, what's the first thing you made? Um I don't remember. I think it would have been cushions. I remember definitely when I was little making a lot of cushions. Mm-hmm. And um, one I remember was doing like a hand, hand sewn English paper piece, sort of six point star that I then turned into a cushion. And that one's still floating around my mum's place somewhere. She still uses that one. I was going to ask if you still had that. Yeah, it's one of the few that survived from that long ago. But yeah, that one's still around. So it was just a, a natural thing for you to sew from your, your mom and your grandma. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you went off to university and your formal education was in, in, in engineering and physics. Yeah. Why these two subjects? Uh, so I always sort of joked that I did physics for the love of it and engineering so I could get a job. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think engineering came about, I went to their open day and the person who was sort of talking about chemical engineering, they'd done their project in Antarctica and that was something that always really excited me. And I was like, oh, I'll do engineering and go do a project in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And that was enough to determine the course of my lifetime, apparently. Um, I've always been a bit spontaneous. Did you make it to Antarctica? Oh, God, no. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but it seemed like a nice idea at the time. I don't think things through often. So has this education helped you where you are now in sewing or your business? Have you been able to, to apply the fundamentals from these? It's interesting because, yeah, when I sort of had to give up engineering, I sort of thought, oh, gosh, well, that's sort of 10 years of my life wasted. But the further I went, especially now that I'm doing those sort of different sort of textile art projects with the laser cutting and everything, Mm -hmm. it's amazing how every day I find the lessons I learned in engineering in terms of like problem solving and just I do some really crazy projects and I tend not to think them through and I'll find myself going, oh God, how am I going to work this out? How can I solve this? And it's those problems I learned in engineering about how to approach a problem, you know, being willing to sort of step outside my comfort zone and try something new. And, you know, also in terms of my business now as well. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of the stuff I learned in engineering in terms of how to approach problems are really important in what I do now. I have to ask, what's fun about physics? (laughs) (laughs) No no judgment. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to ask that. (laughs) Um, I guess I've always been a nerd. Um, And, you know, my dad did physics. And so when I was little, I kind of got bored at school and my dad would give me like extra math problems to do on the weekend. Um, And I've just always loved, I guess, understanding how the world works. And yeah, it just always made sense to me, I guess, which is why it's so surprising I've kind of ended up doing this whole art thing because it's not Mm -hmm. something I ever foresaw would be the road I'd go down. But yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Kind of left brain, right brain. You're you're using both sides with this. It, It really is. But I guess if you look at my work, you can see it's very, um, it's very sort of mathematical in some ways. It's very precise and detailed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you look at the laser cut sort of side of things I've started to bring into it, you can see that kind of engineering physics coming into it. Sure. Um, So, yeah, I'd like to think none of it's been wasted, that it's all kind of led me here and it all comes together in what I do now. So I, I have to ask, I'm fascinated, uh, while at university, you were in the juggling club and you chose the unicycle. Um, why? T- tell us about this. Uh, the unicycle was a pretty small part of what I did. But um, yeah, it was kind of random. I'd been doing a bit of fire twirling previous to university. Wait, fire twirling. Oh and yeah, the, fire twirling. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to do a bit more of it. So I thought I'd go along to the juggling club because they said they did fire twirling. It turns out they did very little fire twirling. Um, but my brother and I actually joined together and we were both a bit nervous to go. So we went along together and the first night we sort of hung around for an hour or so and we were going to head off. And then this guy showed up who was just incredible with Diablos, which you possibly don't know what they are, but they're incredible. And what what are they? Um, it's, oh, it's really hard to explain. It's two sticks with a string and then there's these two sort of hemispheres joined together that rolls along it. You, you'll have to Google oh, it. I, I, think, I, I, no, I, I think I've seen those. I, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Sure. So he did this absolutely amazing thing on it and we were just hooked after that. We're like, yeah, we've got to hang out with these guys. And then, yeah, just years of hanging out and we go down and hang out in the city under the bridge at night and juggle all night long. Like, honestly, my favourite thing was passing clubs between each other and we'd sort of run around and throw the clubs and do all sorts of craziness. Um, And there's a lot of maths in that, I have to say. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And, yeah, so much fun, so many adventures we got up to. In the unicycle. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was kind of a everyone else was doing it sort of thing. And I decided it'd be fun to do like an expedition along one of the bike trails. And so at the, I decided, uh, right, I was going to learn it. I tried off and on for years. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to learn it by the end of the holidays. And we're going to do this 40 kilometer expedition. I don't know how much that is in miles. Um, and so I, we did this overnight expedition on unicycles and it was madness and ended up being very painful, <laughs> but it why, was good why, fun. Why two wheels when you can just use one? Exactly. And, and unfortunately you get a lot of the same jokes when you're riding a unicycle. 
I'm sure. This 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 is fascinating. You you never took the easy route on on anything. Challenging yourself seems to be kind of an underlying theme for you. I think yeah, I always enjoy a challenge. I've always got to have something that I'm working towards, something different. I guess I get bored easily to be honest. Yeah. And and we're going to talk about how you um classify yourself later. You you said you get bored <laughs> easily. We're, we're going to talk about that. Um, but I, I want to go back to your sewing. It's It's been just a, a common theme for you and it carried you for a really long time. And then you were diagnosed with mitro, mitochondrial disease and sewing literally became the ticket to your new future. Um, would you share the story with us and, and how the, this disease affected you? Yeah. So it was, I was actually, I got sick when I was 15 and it was actually when I was 20 that I got diagnosed and I was sick on and off through my uni degree. Um, and I sort of tried to work and struggled with that, which is why I went back to doing my PhD and I thought I'd manage that part time, but then I'd sort of push myself and I get sicker and end up in hospital and then I'd sort of recover and start working again, but then I'd end up in hospital. And there just came a point where I was like, this isn't sustainable. I can't keep doing this. And so I eventually just came to the conclusion, this isn't working. This isn't a life. And I decided that I had to give that up. Mm-hmm. But then I just found myself in a point where I'm like, okay, so I'm 30. I've essentially retired what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And it's just kind of terrifying, I think, to wake up in the morning and have nothing to do, to not know what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And my mum was sort of watching me as I was getting really depressed and just kind of scared. And she just sort of said, hey, why don't we start a long arm quilting business? And I'm like, okay, so neither of us know how to quilt. (laughs) Um, I think you're crazy. why not? (laughs) Yeah. And so I just kind of, I thought about it a bit and thought, well, I guess it sounds kind of fun. And so I pulled out my grandma's like 40-year-old machine and just kind of started doing some free motion quilting. And it was just kind of the most fun thing I'd ever done. And I was just doing, you know, a couple of hours a day just solidly practicing. I was absolutely terrible at it. Um, (laughs) But, you know, I do hold to it that anyone can learn to quilt if they just practice. That's all it is, is practice. And yeah, I got better at it. And eventually we went and started looking at larger machines and I was just hooked from there. And it just gave me something to focus on, something to do with my life. And yeah, it really was a lifesaver. I still don't know where she got the idea from. I have no idea, but it was an absolute lifesaver. It sounds like it. Robin, would you be willing to to talk to us about um, this disease and 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 how it affects individuals is is it um, specific to an individual or is it is it more wide sweeping? It's it's something that I personally had not heard of, um, but there there is a good chance that that of our listeners, somebody might have um, experienced it personally or within their family. Yes, yeah, so it's an interesting disease. It's not well known because it it's sort of. One of the more recent diseases, I think it was only really identified back in the 80s, which is relatively recently. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a genetic disorder. It affects the mitochondria, which is part of the cells, which are responsible for converting energy. And so basically our bodies can't effectively create energy. So that looks different for everyone. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. it's a really large cause of death in infants. But then that ranges and there's a lot of people who don't make it out of adulthood, uh, into adulthood, sorry, make it through adolescence. Um, For me, I'm sort of expected to have a reasonably normal lifespan. But then the symptoms are different for everyone. So I have quite bad gastrointestinal issues. I have a lot of fatigue, migraines, muscle aches and pains. Mm -hmm. Um, My brother... And my mum both have severe tremors. My brother's in a wheelchair. Um, He's been in a wheelchair since he was about 15 just because he shakes so much and has falls. Um, Often people can have, they call them stroke-like episodes and they're similar to strokes and that can Mm -hmm. lead to death. 
So there's a huge range of how people are affected by this disease. Um, and there's also quite a number of diseases that fall under the mitochondrial disease umbrella. So it's a very diverse term. But yeah, pretty much it can sort of affect people in a huge range of ways. And it, it's it's difficult, can be really difficult to get a diagnosis because a lot of doctors aren't familiar with it. Our family was quite lucky in the doctors we had and that they were able to diagnose my brother so early. Um, it took me about four or five years to get diagnosed and even that can be quite a short time for people to get diagnosed. So, yeah, it's complex and it's a challenging disease, but, yeah. Well, you are, and thank you for, for sharing that with us. You are an incredible inspiration in what you've done with your life. And, and we've only talked about a, a little bit of this with your sewing. We're going to get into some of the other things that you've done with your life since this diagnosis um, that are nothing less than amazing. Um, I want to talk about inspirations. You, you were talking about some things. Once you got into quilting, quilting you discovered a huge wealth of inspiration in, in a community. Uh, and that's a, a big thing that this podcast is about. And um, a woman named Anna Mika Mine became your absolute hero, as as well as Beth Ann Nemish, Judy Madsen, and Cindy Needham. Tell us about these people and how they inspired you. Yeah, I think once once you sort of get into the quilting world, I think there's just so much inspiration everywhere you look, especially with the resources in social media and that sort of thing. Um, but Anamika Mine is someone who's almost local to me. She's another person who lives in my state and her work is just incredible. She's very inspired by nature and she sort of started back in, I think, 70s or 80s and I just feel like she was so ahead of her time in terms of what she did with textiles. It was just so creative and original and she sort of didn't have access to all the different fabrics and the sort of fusibles that we have now that we use. And she would just use whatever she could find around. She'd use, you know, old army blankets and just whatever was available and just create the most stunning pieces, just capturing nature. She'd go out into the marshlands and just sort of draw what she saw and you know, study the life cycles of the butterflies and the frogs and all that sort of thing and just create the most amazing pieces capturing that. And they were just massive pieces that she's sort of creating on this tiny little sewing machine and they're just absolutely phenomenal. And I think nature's always been really close to my heart. I used to do a lot of hiking and that sort of thing and just seeing these pieces she created, they're just so moving. Um, and so that was always really inspiring to me to see mm -hmm. that sort of work. And Beth, Beth Ann Nemish, Judy Madsen, Cindy Needham? Yeah, so these are all quilters. So once I started actually doing the machine quilting, I was sort of looking around at different people's work. Beth Ann Nemish was one of the first people I saw who were doing whole cloths and her pictorial whole cloths are just phenomenal. And I think I'd, I'd never really had much of a background in quilting. And so I didn't actually really know that whole cloths were a thing. And when I discovered that you could do whole cloths, you didn't have to bother doing the piecing. You could just quilt. I was so excited by that. And I saw these whole cloths she was doing where she's just basically drawing on fabric with thread. I was so excited by that. Um, I just wish I could draw like she could. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then Judy Madsen just does the most amazing sort of modern quilts and just creating the secondary designs in her quilting, um, which are just phenomenal. And then uh, Cindy Needham, I took, she was actually the first class I did, an online craftsy class teaching about whole cloths. And it just kind of forever changed my outlook on how to design, how to quilt, and, yeah, just incredible. Have you gotten to meet any of them in person? Um, yeah, I've done classes with... Beth Ann Nemish and Judy Madsen. Mm -hmm. I haven't managed to meet Cindy Needham yet. And I'm really excited. I'm going to finally see an exhibition by Anamika Mine in a couple of months. She's having a sort of lifetime exhibition. 
So I, I've heard some people who've been to see it already and they just said it's beyond incredible. So I'm really excited to see that. You know, one of the things we do on this podcast is after a while, we check back in with people who have been our guests. So when oh, we yeah. check back in with you, we're going to ask about that exhibit. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be mind blowing. When uh, when the pandemic hit uh, and shut down quilt shows, um, you turned to textile art. Why did you choose this? It's interesting. So when it was sort of just at, before the pandemic hit that I finished my biggest show quilt ever and I'd been so excited about that. And then I think I entered it in probably half a dozen quilt shows and they all got cancelled. Mm. And while that's nowhere near the biggest tragedy of the pandemic, it was really hard for me having worked on that for sort of 18 months and then just to be like, oh, I don't know if this is ever going to get seen by anyone. And normally once I finish one, I'll sort of have a bit of a down period while I'm like, oh, what am I going to do next? Um, but I sort of tried to start on the next quilt and I just couldn't find any motivation to start working on something because I was kind of like, I don't know if there's going to be more quilt shows. I don't know how my last quilt is going to go. I don't know what to do. And so for a long time, I just kind of floundered and I couldn't really find any motivation to work on anything. And so eventually I just did this sort of six inch square piece that was very different from my normal style. I used a lot of colors. It wasn't a traditional sort of quilting design. It was very modern. I used really thick black lines and made it a very abstract painting sort of style of piece. And I really loved the look of it and the freedom to do something so very different. And then I ended up framing it and it ended up selling at a local art show we had. And that was really exciting for me to have this sort of different direction and to actually finish a piece in a week or two rather than in 18 months. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of fell in love with that style of work and things just took a new direction from there. What are you working on now? What's your recent work? Um, I've got a few things that are sort of underway at the moment. I've Things took a different change of direction recently and I started working on my mini make series which are patchwork earring kits which I sell mm -hmm. um, and so I've been doing a lot of work getting them packed and sent out and I'm just about to put out a new series which are patchwork brooches which have a similar idea. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been doing a lot of miniature whole cloths which I'm really excited about and really enjoy. So I'm just sort of keeping up working on a series of them. And um, can we see these items on your website? Uh, yeah, the mini makes are available through there. And um, okay. my miniatures I keep posting on my Instagram account. Excellent. And, and at the end of this uh, conversation, we'll tell people how they can, can find you to check this out. All right. Now, earlier I promised um, that we were going to talk about some of the um, just amazing things that you do in your spare time. And I'm fascinated with this. And it's uh, interesting to me, it's all focused on water. So you love snorkeling, underwater photography, and of all things, free diving. Um, first of all, why are these important to you? Um, I think I've always sort of love snorkeling and just getting out. I mean, Australia has some absolutely beautiful reefs. So I love sort of traveling around and visiting them. I think, so I always used to be really uh, love the outdoors. I used to do a lot of hiking. I used to be into rock climbing. I did do a bit of skydiving at one point. Um, mm -hmm. But I lost being able to do a lot of that with my illness. And so that was really hard for me. I felt like I lost some of my identity when I couldn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But snorkeling is something I can still do. The water is really good for my joints. And it just gives me a huge sense of freedom in the water. Um, I think water's like being immersed in the ocean is so good for our health and our mental health. And it just feels so freeing. Um, I've talked to a lot of people about sort of free diving and snorkeling and that sort of thing. And it just feels like flying for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's just such an amazing feeling, especially for me when I often feel so trapped in my body. Being in the water is just such a freeing feeling. 
So tell us more about free diving. I, I think, Robin, it's it's a sport that people don't know much about. How do you learn to do it? I, I'm assuming it's a pretty um, mental thing where where you need to. Well, I, I'm I'm way out of my league on this. So just <laughs> just talk to us about this. I, I think it's wonderful. Well, I'm actually pretty new to it, but I guess I've always snorkeled and sort of held my breath and dived underwater just to get a closer look at things. But I've sort of been getting into it on a more, I don't know, maybe formal level. I've actually done a course recently and it's about holding your breath and diving down. Um, yeah, it's about, it's really about relaxation, which is kind of funny because a lot of those sports that seem more sort of adrenaline fueled about being mm-hmm. really excited, whereas this is about really learning to just relax and sort of control your mental processes. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's just such an amazing feeling to just be so calm and relaxed while being <laughs> so far underwater. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just feels incredible. I don't know how else to explain it, to be honest. <laughs> you, you can you can you can hear your love for it when yeah. you talk about it. How how deep have you gone freediving so far? And do you have a goal? Um, I've only gone about ten meters because. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere terribly deep around here. I've got a trip planned in a few weeks where, which has a much, is much deeper. We'll see how far down I manage to get. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the challenge is in equalizing your ears Mm -hmm. so that you can get down deeper. That's sort of one of the biggest issues you face. So I'm really excited to explore just how deep I can go. We're going to check in with you on that too. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Um, so you um, you mentioned earlier that you tend to get bored, and I'm going to quote you here. I think I may be a goldfish. I feel like I have quite a short attention span, and I'm always looking for the next shiny thing. So what's your next shiny thing? I don't really know. I mean, I'm pretty obsessed with the free diving snorkeling thing at the moment. I've got a trip coming up to Lady Elliot Island on the Great Barrier Reef. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm also, as I said, working on getting out some more of these uh, patchwork brooches. So that pattern release is going to be coming up shortly and working on more miniature designs, uh, miniature quilt, whole cloth quilts. I've got so many ideas, to be honest. I don't sleep. There's just always ideas going round and round in my head. There's a list sort of 10 miles long. Yeah, it, it's always so hard to decide what's next. Well, then the, let me ask you, what's your dream? My dream. In some ways, I feel like I'm living my dream, I think. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. For a long time, I was really terrified of where my life would go. And I never envisaged I would be this happy, to be honest. I feel so lucky that things have worked out so well and that I've ended up so happy doing what I'm doing. Um, and I think I'm just so grateful for my to my mum for all the support she's given me over the years. I feel like she's had to put up with a lot and she's been amazing with how much she's encouraged me to pursue what I'm doing now. Like I said, I guess I'd love to go over to, the, to America again. I'd love to do some more exhibitions. There's a lot I'd like to do. Hawaii would be lovely. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd like to travel more, um, but it's just going to be a matter of seeing where things go. I think I try not to, I, I've kind of learned to be honest, not to try and plan too much, have too many dreams because it can be really hard when they don't happen. Um, I, I tend to more just live in the moment and see what happens and just be excited for what's happening at the time. Well, again, like I said earlier, Robin, you're an inspiration 10 times over. Uh, and uh, I, as a matter of fact, you were recommended to us to be on this um, podcast by a prior guest who said you absolutely must meet Robin. And uh, now I can, I can see why. Um, Thank you. In all that we talked about today, is there a question I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Gosh, I don't know. I don't think so. You've been very thorough. <laughs> Well, it, um, it, you, your life gave us much to talk about, and it's been terrific to catch up with you today. And as I mentioned before we, we started recording, um, I kind of geek out on the fact that you're in Australia and <laughs> I'm in the States. You are 
in tomorrow morning and I'm in the afternoon on the day before. And it's just, this has been wonderful that you took the time to, to join. You are first interview from Australia. Uh, so thank you for taking the time today. Oh, thank you. It's been lovely to chat with you. Robin, um, when our listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to uh, catch up with you? Uh, you can find me either through my website at robinjdesigns.com.au or else through Instagram at robinjdesigns. Excellent. No doubt people will be looking for you shortly. Uh, and thank you again, Robin. Thanks. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you, someone for whom sewing and quilting is so much more than a hobby. It's a way of life and a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to meg at soandsopodcast.com or complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to, review, and rate this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our website, soandsopodcast.com, for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So and So. So-and-so.